everybody. I would like to welcome you to the webinar series, Building Back Better for Nova Scotian Workers. St. Fax University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledges that we are gathered today in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are grateful for the peace and friendship treaties. Before we proceed with tonight's webinar, please know that it will be recorded and shared on the organizers' social media channels. The webinar series, Building Back Better for Nova Scotian Workers, is a partnership between the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour and St. Francis Xavier University's Extension Department and Cody International Institute. The series is sponsored by Extension's Topshi Memorial Fund. This evening's webinar is the first in a series that will highlight key issues facing Nova Scotia workers as our, as our new normal emerges in the aftermath of COVID-19. The webinars will be held monthly for the next four to six months and topics will range from childcare to minimum wage. The Topshi Memorial Fund was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. Evax Extension Department from 1969 until 1982. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their cooperatives and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. The death of Father Topshi prompted leaders in the labor movement in Atlantic Canada to initiate the Topshi Memorial Fund. From 1984 until 2004, the St. Evex Extension Department hosted 18 Topshi Memorial Conferences with topics ranging from the nature of human work to globalization, attracting an average of almost 300 people per conference. It is very fitting to breathe new life into Topshi's legacy by sponsoring this webinar series at this time. I would now like to call upon Danny Cavanaugh, President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour, to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation and to lead us in remembering those who have lost their lives or suffered injury or illness on the job or due to a work-related tragedy with a moment of silence on this International Day of Mourning. Danny? Oh, thanks, Pauline, and welcome, everybody, and thanks so much for taking some time out of your business busy schedules to jo join us in this important series of webinars that we're going to be doing with the uh, with the Cody Institute and through the Topsy Fund. And I want to take a moment and thank them very much for we've been probably close to a year since we first met to talk about some of the things that we could do. And of course, the pandemic means that we have to do much of the things that we're going to do currently through webinar series kinds of stuff because we can't, you know, formally gather. So maybe before we get started and before I talk a little bit about the Federation and what it is that we do, I'd ask everybody that we could just take a, few, a moment of silence, please. Thank you. So just, a little, sorry, I was just going to give a little bit about the Federation of Labour. So we represent about 65,000 unionized members um, in Nova Scotia that are affiliated with the Canadian Labour Congress. And we do a wide variety of work to represent workers, not just unionized workers, but all workers in the province. So we work to make change on a number of fronts that, you know, affect everybody every day in their workplace. So as they say, unions brought you, you know, the 40 hour work week, uh, holidays, the weekends, all those kinds of things. So we continue to do that work. So it's important to recognize that most of the unions in Nova Scotia are affiliated with the Federation of Labor. Our executive is about 23 members. Essentially, most of the union leaders that are affiliated sit on our executive of the of the Federation of Labor. 
and you know so we um we do that work uh we do that work together we work to support you know um the unions in the province but also the non-union workers and we do that work based on resolutions that come to our annual convention that's held every two years where delegates approve a number of resolutions on things like you talked about earlier pauline child care or minimum mm -hmm. wage or health and safety regulations uh, we have seven committees we have a uh, occupational health and safety committee uh, nicole who's one of the speakers tonight nicole mckim who's also a representative with nsgu is the chair of our occupational health and safety committee as well and she's participating here with us tonight mm -hmm. so that's a little bit about the federation and the work we do so again i want to say thanks to to Cody and to the Topshi Fund as we kind of roll these out in the future and hopefully mm -hmm. someday we'll get back to having some maybe conferences which mm -hmm. will be which will be really great. Oh, that would be great Danny thank you and again St. of X is very pleased to partner with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor to offer building back better for Nova Scotian workers and before I introduce tonight's speakers I'll say a few words about the process. Each of our three speakers will have seven to eight minutes to deliver their comments I will ask members of the audience to type your questions into chat and as many of them as possible will be addressed in the open discussion and question and answer period. Your mic will remain muted while we hear from our speakers, but it may be open for you to ask a question at the appropriate time. If you have a technical issue, please go back to the link for the webinar and rejoin the call. If you're experiencing other issues during the call, please, um, uh, please type a note in chat directed to Brian Lazuri, who is providing technical assistance for us this evening. And if possible, Brian will assist you. At this time, I am very pleased to welcome our first speaker, Mr. Alan Martin, who will speak about the Westray experience and legacy. Danny Kavanaugh will be our second speaker who will address issues with the Westray Act and its implementation and enforcement. And finally, we'll hear from Nicole McKim, who will talk about occupational health and safety and what it means for workers during the coronavirus pandemic. Let us first welcome Alan Martin. Alan is retired from Northern Pulp. He began as a member of the West Ray families on May 9th, 1992, and is a brother of Glenn David Martin, who was killed in the West Ray mine explosion. Mr. Martin is one of the directors of the Westray Memorial Park, and he is a health and safety advocate. Welcome, Alan. Good evening. <clears throat> yeah. Well, since May 9th, um, the Westray Family Group has been working tirelessly to promote health and safety. We have, uh, we, oh. <clears throat> I'm not starting off very well. We um, take every opportunity to tell our story, to uh, make things better, to, uh, we have done interviews for uh, people who are writing books. We have done fifth estate interviews. We have done uh, uh, public debates uh, on anything from uh, Westray to how media handles uh, these types of issues. We uh, have, uh, we, we as a group um, give out uh, bursaries each year, three bursaries to the three high schools in Pictou County. And the topic is always on safety. Uh, so we try to make it current and different each year. And the whole idea of it is so that the students will look up what they, what they need to know about being safe as students and later on in work and uh, public work. Um, we lobbied on uh, Parliament Hill to get uh, Bill C-45 passed, which is what is now currently called the Westray Bill. 
the work, that's just a few of the things that we've been doing over the years. And I have to tell you that it's tiring. It's uh, frustrating, but it is also rewarding. Uh, I know we make a difference. Sometimes, sometimes uh, it's hard to see the difference we're making, but I get comments from people. I see uh, like all the, the labor groups, uh, they're making change. They're, it, it takes relentless conversation. It takes stamina and it's, it's heard on people, it's heard on families. I know in my own case, my own children were 14 and 15 when uh, the Westray explosion occurred. And at that age, young girls need a lot of attention. And uh, that's one of my biggest regrets is I spent a lot of time doing this kind of work when I should have been spending more time with them. It's draining physically, emotionally, but it is certainly worth it. And in these economic times, I mean, COVID is something that I can't speak of because we're all in the midst of it. We don't know what the end result's going to be. But Westry story is never going to grow old because it's everybody's story. It's just different circumstances. Um, families are ruined and lives are changed forever. And I find it extremely hard to understand why those, the people in power, the people who have the power to make a difference, why we have to work so hard to get them to understand that workers matter, lives matter. Thousands of people are being injured every year. Families are being destroyed and it's almost as if nobody cares until it happens to them individually. And uh, it's our, it's our uh, legacy, I guess, to change that as much as we can. There's too much hurt going on. Um, I think that's about all I can say. Thank you so much, Alan. C clearly, the impact of the Westray mine explosion has had a profound and lasting effect on you and on so many. Uh, thank you so sincerely for sharing your story with us this evening. It sounds as if the mission of the Westray Families Group is to keep the story alive to ensure that the learning from what happened from this tragic, tragic event is never lost. And that as young people grow up, they are aware of the importance of having a safe workplace as they enter it themselves. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alan. I would now like to call upon Danny Kavanaugh to come back and to share with us the perspective of the Federation of Labor. But before doing so, I would like to note that Danny was first elected president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor in October 2015 and was reelected in 2017 for another two year term, representing 80,000 members in over 400 union locals. Before this, he served as vice president at large for over 10 years. Danny has been instrumental in ensuring the work of the Federation makes Nova Scotia a better place to live and work. Danny? No, thanks, Pauline. And uh, Alan, uh, a great job about a very personal, you know, tragedy that happened within your own family and kiddos to you for the work that you've done over the years, you know, to keep the awareness about Westray and that tragedy alive. And I just want to mention 
about the work that Alan's done over the years to keep the Westray Memorial Park going. If anybody has never been to the Westray Memorial Park, you, you should take a visit over there. And next year will be the 30 years mark um it'll be the 30th anniversary of that mine disaster so many young people aren't even really aware of that so that's why it's so important to continue to do this work and and make sure that our young people uh, know and understand that these tragedies do happen and they affect a, a large number of people and their families forever so so the Westray mine exploded in in 1992 it was only in operation for a year you know, and there was lots of lots of complaints, I guess, around coal dust and other safety issues at the mine. They were trying to unionize the mine at the time. And then the work that Alan and some others did around trying to get the Westray bill, you know, introduced by government. So it had some teeth when these things happened because that company that ran that mine um, really got off scot-free at the end of the day. And that was that's a sad uh, reality of about that stuff, you know, and it's the employer's obligation to make sure that workers are protected and workers are safe. And it was in 2004 when the Westray bill um, was enacted by the federal government. Part of the issue that we've been working on is a, is a Federation of Labor. And I know the Canadian Labor Congress and others are, are working on this is too, is that uh, since 2004 and the Westray bill came into effect, there's been very few criminal charges. So the Westray bill allows for criminal charges to happen and criminal charges to be laid in the event of a workplace death or, you know, a workplace accident. And under that bill C-45, it's only the Crown, meaning the police that can lay charges. So our provincial inspectors are under a completely different jurisdiction. They can't lay criminal charges or proceed uh, with criminal charges. So under the Westray bill, um, there's only been, I'm going to say less than 25 uh, criminal charges that have ever been laid under that bill. One in Nova Scotia. So you saw Shannon uh, Kempton early talk about her father who was killed in a workplace accident when uh, the gas tank exploded on a car that he was working on. There was criminal charges laid. Um, against the person that operated that facility, that workplace, and uh, those charges were acquitted. So the Westray bill isn't working, you know, the way it needs to work since 2004, if you can imagine, with at least a thousand workers dying on the job per year in Canada. And since 2004, since the bill was enacted, we've only had, you know, less than 25 criminal charges laid under that bill then that bill isn't doing as it was intended to do. And that's the sad reality of it. So we still need to do some work to pressure the government to make sure, as an example, our police forces are better trained. And so they know that when they are first on the scene, and in most cases, the police are first on the scene, uh, when there is a workplace accident, that they can actually shut the workplace down, start a criminal investigation, not every workplace will end up with criminal charges. I, you know, I realize that, but they can start that investigation. And if it leads them down the road to where there needs to be criminal charges laid, then they can proceed with that. And they need to work hand in hand, of course, with our, with our provincial inspectors. So there's a lot, a, a, a lot of important work um, that needs to happen. Last year in Nova Scotia, we've had uh, 32 workers that died at work. That's 32 people that left for work in the morning and didn't come home that evening. Now, I want people to understand as well during that, you know, in those 32 deaths, there's a number of, you know, we had the mass shootings where uh, two of those people killed um, were nurses or actually uh, union members. Um, we had the, you know, the, mili the military people on, in the helicopter crash that were killed. And we continue to have a number of fishing accidents in the province where there's a number of people killed as well. So I think we need to we need to recognize all those things, right? As we work towards the goal to make sure no worker should leave home and not come home at the end of the day because they died at or because of work. So there's a lot of there's a lot of work that we need to do. There's a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that no employer like those that ran the Westray um, mine 
can ever be allowed to run and operate a business under under such tragic conditions where there's numerous complaints about occupational health and safety. They need to be taken seriously. We have a lot of work to do in Nova Scotia around updating, you know, um, some of our regulations and our Occupational Health and Safety Act and the Labor Standards Act as well in Nova Scotia, which hasn't been updated in its entirety in 40 years. So a lot of this stuff could use a modernization. And one of the other things that we've been working on in the last while is around um, with the province around the 1-800 number. So anybody that's driving down the, the street and you see something that you believe is unsafe, somebody working on a roof maybe or whatever, whatever it might be, if you're in a workplace and you know that, um, that something you see or there's something in the workplace that your employer isn't paying any attention to, you can call this 1-800 number. It's 1-800-952-2687. And you can call that lines answered, um, you know, at 12 hours a day, I think, by a real person. And it goes to a voice message after that. But uh, it's confidential. You don't have to leave your name. And you and you can report any unsafe work that you, that you might see, you know, or you're aware of that happens, right? In Nova Scotia, in Nova Scotia, we do have you know, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act that people need to have an Occupational Health and Safety Committee in your workplace. So workplaces with over 20 workers um, that um, have work that happens more than four weeks out of, the, out of the year must have an Occupational Health and Safety Committee and workplaces with over five workers needs to have an Occupational Health and Safety worker representative. So I would implore people to take a look at the act uh, make sure that you have a workplace occupational health and safety committee in your workplace where it's required. And if you don't have one, you need to get one. And that committee needs to be comprised of, uh, you know, the same amount of, amount of worker representatives as there are employer representatives. Uh, you're there at that table with equal voice and the workers should be the ones picking their worker representatives on their occupational health and safety committee. So that's a, that's a little bit about, you know, um, I don't want to, I could go on for quite a while, but I know time is running short. You asked us to stick to the time limit. So I'm going to, you know, try to stick to that time limit as much as we can. Of course, we're happy to take questions. And if we do have a couple of campaigns on um, paid sick days that we desperately need in this province, I'll put these in the chat line. But also now because of the pandemic and workers now that are working on the front line, so those non-union people, mostly in the grocery stores or pharmacies or gas stations or truck drivers. Uh, we want them to log on to our website and share their story with us in confidence. If there's an issue at their workplace, we will make sure that that issue gets looked at and it gets corrected if it needs some correction. So I'll share those links, uh, Pauline, in the in the mm -hmm. chat here in a, in a few minutes for people. Great. And, uh, and we can move ahead with the next speaker. So thanks okay. again. Great. Thanks so much, Danny. And uh, it, it's amazing to think about the Westray bill having been passed and we still had the deaths of, of 30 workers in this province last year, where we know one death is far too much. And uh, so lots of work remaining to be done. And thank you so much for sharing some, some ways in which people can, can get involved and become part of that work to make that difference that's still so, so necessary and so required. Our final speaker this evening is Nicole McKim. Nicole has been an employee relations officer at the Nova Scotia Government Employees Union since November 2011. She has represented members working in healthcare, housing, pension services, centers for education, school bus drivers, and Canada Blood Services. Currently, Nicole represents government employees, civil servants, working in professional occupations in Metro, as well as employees working for the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, stores, distribution centers, and head office. She services and negotiates collective agreements and assists with members with all matters related to their workplace, including occupational health and safety issues. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you, Pauline. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, in my role as an employee relations officer, I provide advice and advocacy for employees working in public sector unionized environments. 
I represent workers in hundreds of workplaces across Nova Scotia in countless different types of jobs. I, much like everybody else, did not foresee this pandemic, nor did I ever expect that I would, I would be dealing with such a widespread singular uh, workplace issue. Um, I think that the event tonight is, is quite timely where it falls on the International Day of Mourning, which as we've heard from Danny, is a day to recognize employees who have been injured or died as a result of their workplace. Most people face some kind of personal risk in their work environment, but this pandemic has increased that risk exponentially. Early on in the pandemic, it became very clear very quickly that most workplaces were not equipped to deal with something of this magnitude. The effects that the pandemic has had on workplaces is endless and the connectivity between the impacts of our workplace and our home life has never, be, never been more amplified. Work-life balance used to simply be about finding harmony between the two aspects of your life. Now that balance is skewed and it is blurred because each side drastically impacts the other. For example, if an employee is sick, has a sick parent or a young child at home, they're forced to find a way to care for their loved one while staying employed. They have to make it work, uh, whether or not their workplace has resources such as paid leave to help them out. On the other hand, many workers are facing dramatic uh, increases in workload. This can affect their hours of work, it can affect their mental health, and both of which we know can have a significant impact on home life. This is all in addition to the obvious constant worry that workplace exposure uh, may occur and the impacts that that would have on a personal life as well as on uh, a worker's family. So we know different levels of government have worked to implement policy and resources to help, but for some it's just not enough. And everybody has a story on how this has impacted them from a health perspective, a financial one, or really anything in between. In my role, the most common issue that I've had to deal with through the pandemic is workplace health and safety. Suddenly, attitudes around OH&S evolved from simply ensuring that you had employees who were uh, you know, up to date on their first aid training to implementing measures and protocols to keep a deadly virus out of the workplace. Occupational health and safety immediately and unilaterally became the number one workplace issue. Dealing with OH&S matters in the workplace through the pandemic has been an evolutionary process. We started off with personal protection. Oh, I think I muted, sorry. Uh, we started off with personal protection equipment being the main focus of concern to keep workers safe, especially given the early uh, shortages of, uh, of PPE in the early days of the pandemic. Workplaces shifted to allowing workers to work from home where possible. And we implemented mandatory masking, distancing, and other regulatory measures. Since the onset, we've been forced to pivot on an almost daily basis as more information is learned and restrictions are lifted and tightened. Individual and workplace adherence to public health recommendations seem to ebb and flow based on the seriousness of the pandemic situation in Nova Scotia at any given point. Through providing advice to workers on oh &S measures and processes related to the pandemic, I came to the concerning realization that many workers are very much unaware of their rights when it comes to workplace health and safety. Having worked in a unionized environment for 20 years, I was of the mindset that most people knew what their basic rights are and how those rights can and should be uh, utilized under the current situation. I was really wrong. Uh, I then worried for non-unionized workers who don't have an advocate or someone to seek advice from. Working during a pandemic is tough to navigate for anyone, but not knowing your rights and how to apply them could be devastating. Every worker in the province of Nova Scotia needs to know that they have a basic fundamental right to be safe at work. This includes the right to refuse work as provided for under the Nova Scotia Occupational Health and Safety Act. I just want to touch on this uh, from, a, from a procedural perspective. So the right to refuse unsafe work is a very personal decision. It requires a worker to make a subjective assessment of their own personal health, as well as the safety of any other people in their workplace. As a matter of process, if a worker feels that their workplace is it, or a task that they've been assigned to uh, is not safe, they need to report this to their supervisor. 
the employee is then not required to perform that task until the supervisor has addressed and adequately mitigated the risk. Workers should know that they can be assigned to perform other tasks uh, while the supervisor deals with the unsafe working condition. They also have pay protection during this time. In addition, the supervisor is required to identify to any other employee that they intend to assign the work to that an employee has refused to perform this work uh, due to unsafe conditions. If a supervisor is able to fix the problem, the refusal can end at that point. If, however, they do not or are unable to address the hazard, the matter may be referred to the Workplace Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committee uh, or, the, or the rep, depending on the workplace, uh, the numbers in the workplace. This is why it's so important for every workplace to have a functioning Josh or rep in place. The Joint Occupation or health and safety committee is then tasked with reviewing the issue and where appropriate implementing safe work practices to mitigate the risk. They may also come to the determ determination unilaterally that there is, no, uh, there is no risk, at which point the uh, refusal will end. If the committee is unable to come to a unanimous decision, the matter can then be escalated to the Department of Labor who will investigate and render a decision of which an employer must adhere to. This basic right is relevant to the health and safety issues we're facing in the workplace as a result of the pandemic. If your workplace is not providing for proper protections to keep you safe per the public health guidelines, you can do something about it. You can speak up. I wanted to take the opportunity to relay this very basic and fundamental process in hopes that it may reach even one worker who might not have been aware. We have the ability to prevent injuries uh, in the workplace, illnesses, and fatalities, simply by applying and enforcing laws and regulations that are already in place. As mentioned, the pandemic has brought to light the importance of workplace health and safety. And bearing in mind the theme of this webinar series is building back better for Nova Scotia workers. It's my sincere hope that at the end of all this, workers in this province will be more aware of the risks associated with their jobs and how they can protect themselves and others. In addition to this, since I have the platform for another minute, I just wanted to personally acknowledge and thank the workers of the province of Nova Scotia who have in some way put their own health and safety at risk to try to help keep things going in as normal and positive way as possible. If you're privileged enough to be in a position where you can help somebody else, you should. We've all had a role to play through this and the sacrifice and the commitment that workers have shown should not be lost on any of us. So a sincere thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. You have raised lots of food for thought for all workers, particularly those on the front line. And it really struck me the importance of education and awareness for workers about what their rights are, in fact. Uh, I think about all of the young people who are working in the grocery stores and the, and the uh, essential service uh, occupations today and wondering how many of those would be truly aware of their rights to, to safety in the workplace as they go about serving the greater population during this most unusual and difficult time uh, compliments of the COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks so much for all of the all of the really important issues that you've raised. Having heard from all three of our speakers, I would now like to invite you, uh, if you haven't already done so, to type any questions that you might have into the chat function for our speakers. We have about 15 to 20 minutes for open discussion, questions and answers. And we would love to, to, to have you engage with our speakers in a meaningful way. So I'm just going to open my screen and take a look and see what we've got here. And we'll give the speakers just a moment to catch their breath. I see that uh, Danny Cavanaugh has added lots of links here, a link for uh, you to share your story with the Federation of Labor. There's a link provided on paid sick leave, one uh, another for sharing your workplace story. And I see a message from an Ian Johnson who says, I strongly support the Westray Families Group. Wonder why the Westray Act has been so ineffective. What can be done to strengthen it? Can we ever make sure there will be no more Westrays? So I'm wondering if one of our speakers would like to take a, 
take a, a stab at responding to Ian's question. Um, Alan, would you like to speak to that? Or Danny, would you like to give it the first the first crack? Yeah, Alan can go ahead and then I'll add a couple of things we're doing. Great. Alan? Well, well, um, it's obvious that they enacted a piece of legislation and they didn't um, educate the uh, the people who administer it, uh, the, the police, uh, the uh, prosecutors, judges, even. they don't know how to apply it. They don't know that all workplace accidents are a potential crime scene. Mm -hmm. And they stick to what they know, which is the regular uh, criminal charges. And uh, unless they're informed, they're not even going to think of the Westbury Bill. Right, so the awareness raising is absolutely key. Yeah, Danny, would you, yeah, would you like to add to that? Sure. No. So I just, I just, yeah, that. So we are currently working with the province. Um, there's going to be a seminar in June, uh, where they've invited a number of police departments and uh, and some of their investigators to do some training, and we're going to spend a day and talk about some training, so the police are more aware of you know, that they need to do those criminal investigations. The RCMP mm -hmm. nationally has been doing a lot of work. The Congress, Canadian Labor Congress has been working with them nationally. So mm -hmm. they do have a training program in place that they're sharing with the municipal police forces. I know as an example to the Newfoundland constabulary um, mm -hmm. is are doing some good work over there around some training as well. So we're slowly getting there, but it's been far too long. It should have been something that was rolled out when the bill was actually first passed. And I just want to make one other kind of interesting point about the day of morning because we're mm -hmm. here today and we want to build back better, mm -hmm. you know, and, and talk about these things. But the day of morning was actually established back in 1983 by a couple of members of CUPE National. Um, in 1983, the Cuban National Convention in that year passed a resolution to have a national day of mourning. Um, that resolution went to the Canadian Labor Congress Convention in 1984. And then shortly thereafter, that's when the federal government recognized the national day of mourning. But, you know, that's been so it's been around for a while. And that's why we need to put our collective selves together to make sure that we're, you know, people know what their rights are. They know to speak up when there's something not right in their workplace. If they have a concern about things that they do have a right to refuse on safe work. So I think all those things are very important. We have a lot of education to do in Nova Scotia. if We want to change the culture, right? And the big, the big change that I'd like to see, and Alan touched on this a bit was around when the judges actually hand out, um, you know, penalties to employers who are found in violation of uh, an occupational health and safety you know the the legislation that those fines need to be a lot bigger given a twenty thousand dollar fine to a major corporation is really a slap on the wrist and the other sad reality is those fines are actually um as far as i know tax it can use them as a tax deduction of all things so we need we get some work to do around you know, making sure that those employers are, are, you know, when they're when they have charges laid against them and they're found guilty, that you know that the the judges, I guess, in the province, mm -hmm. um, understand that the bigger the fine, the more likely that's going to change the culture of occupation, the culture of occupational health and safety in the province. Sorry to be long winded, but no, that's fine, Danny. Thank you so much. I have a request with regard to process, and that is, uh, was right here from Anthony Scoggins. He is wondering if he can encourage participants making a comment to share it with everyone, which means hitting the tab for all panelists and attendees. And that is to ensure that everyone on the uh, participating in the webinar can see the questions that are being posed. So if you could uh, hit all panelists and the attendees, everyone will have an opportunity to see your question before it is raised. We have a comment from uh, Bob James that says, we need the labor federations in the COVID six provinces to help the unorganized like 
the Nova Scotia Fed has. This is true leadership, Nova Scotia Fed. So a, a, a good uh, support for the work that's happening here on the ground. Uh, we also have uh, another show of support for the West Ray Families Group and the wonder uh, the work that they've been doing. A question has been posed. Could someone explain the status of the sick day campaign in Nova Scotia? There seems to be lots happening across Canada these days and in other provinces. So Danny, would you like to handle that one as well? Sure, okay. And I see in the chat line, somebody asked for the 1-800 number again too. So I'll just yes. repeat that number so people can call this number. Uh, it's yeah. confidential. You don't have to leave your name. It's 1-800. 952-2687. So, and that's that goes for questions around labor standards as well. So people can call that number. And okay. when people need to feel free, if you do call the number and you don't get any action from them, please let me know. Because I can I can make sure that gets corrected. So in the in the two things that I shared the links to, one is on our campaign. Uh, to get paid sick days so we need we desperately need paid sick days and especially uh, you know the pandemic i think has really shone a light on that only two provinces currently have any kind of paid sick days and that's pei in quebec and it's only two days in pei i think in one day in quebec nova scotia allows in the labor standards a number of days off without pay but that's not much good Part of the problem is that Nicole touched on is people that are going to work, you know, in a in a in a grocery store or a pharmacy or whatever. And every day we see a number of um, different places where there's been, you know, the government's announcing, you know, don't go to Shetch and Shetch a grocery store. There's been an exposure there. Go get tested. That list is growing and growing every day. So those are really we need to look at those as workplace exposures because that's really what they are. It's not just a warning to, you know, the customers that may have went in that store between the hours of two or four, or whatever it happens to be. Those are also workplace exposures and people are very, are very afraid. And that's a, one of the reasons why we want to try to get at least 10 paid sick days. And we need to have legislation in effect when there's a pandemic that if people have to stay home because they tested positive, that they don't lose any compensation. People shouldn't have to choose between going to work because they need to put food on their table, they need to pay their rent, they need to pay their bills, right? Or, but it's also a huge public policy issue for for a number, for all of us really at the end of the day that who wants somebody going to work and exposing other people because they can't afford not to go to work, right? So there's some inherent risk involved with that. So you would think that our elected officials would want to put something like this in place and it needs to be put in place so the employers are responsible. This shouldn't be a bill that taxpayers need to foot. And it's the same with our campaign around, we want to hear your story. So we want to hear from people on the front lines so we can help and take corrective action. You know, when something gets reported through us, we can, I'll take that directly to the officials at Department of Labor. And I will say they've been very good when we ran this campaign last March, when the pandemic first started. Every response, um, you know, that we received um, was looked after. So, you know, it's it's about a working relationship. We're here as a Federation of Labor. We want to work with people, you know. And I noticed somebody said in the chat, too, as well, around um, being a bit organized and stuff, right? I think one of the other things that you're going to see come out of the pandemic is just simply because the way people have been treated without paid sick days, you know, you give people $2 an hour more for a few weeks and then Zippo, you take it away again. Then we find out those same corporations are making, you know, billions more in profits during a pandemic and that, you know, they don't want to pay their workers any more money. So the treat, how people get treated are going to, I think, drive more people to want to become a unionized workplace and people shouldn't be afraid to do that. That's a fundamental right under the Canadian Charter, and that's the worker's choice in those workplaces. Okay, thanks, Danny. I'm seeing some more support in the comments, uh, a message from someone saying, I just signed a petition from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor to ask for paid sick days in Nova Scotia and shared that post on my Facebook page. Great. 
Nicole, I'm wondering, does anything come up for you in this regard? Uh, paid sick time must be something that you hear about uh, from folks, if not your members, but others by virtue of them knowing the role that you play. Do you have any any comments you could relate? Yes, I, I for the most part, I'm fortunate enough to represent individuals who do have paid sick time, of yes. course. Yeah. Uh, but but sort of a new evolution in all of this with uh, with the increase in in testing, which is fantastic, obviously. Uh, but now we're running into an issue where we have workers who have been uh, in maybe one of the whether it's um, they've been in an exposure site, and and with that comes some directive from public health whether they have to isolate or not. Mm -hmm. So it it is creating a bit of another issue, uh, another layer to all of this, um, where we have employees who um, may not be testing positive, um, but they're in that sort of waiting period. So so prior to their test, which can take mm -hmm. a couple of days, and and, and then yeah. after. Um, so there, most of the employers that I've been, uh, that I work with are providing for paid admin leave, but that's mm -hmm. not something in the collective agreement. So, so they are providing for it, I presumably because it's the right thing to do, uh, but they don't have to. So if somebody does end up testing uh, positive, of course, that would, that would switch then to their, to their sick time. If they're, mm -hmm. if they're lucky enough to have some sick time. Uh, right. But it is a little bit of a new phenomenon where we have this period of time where where they've been uh, told to isolate while waiting yeah. test results. So it, it is something like I said, it's everything is uh, very uh, it, it evolves yes. as the, as the situation evolves and, and new new things come up all the yeah. time. I'm sure they do. And Nicole, mm -hmm. I have a question from a viewer who's asking in practice, how does the right to refuse actually work? So. Um, when an employee is, whether you're asked to do something um, that you think is unsafe in the workplace, mm -hmm. or if we're going to sort of connect it to the pandemic itself, um, you know, I've been advising people pretty frequently um, when they are in a workplace where, for example, there is no distancing uh, mm -hmm. or folks aren't wearing masks or, or whatever the case may be. You, the first step really is to take it to your supervisor. Um, you need to identify what the problem is. Um, mm -hmm. If they're able to to fix it in the moment great it doesn't need to go any further but if it is something that um, is you know truly posing a risk to your mm -hmm. health and safety or somebody else that's in your work environment you do need to make them aware of that risk mm -hmm. um, and and they have to address it uh, okay. in some way and if they fail to do that that's when it can escalate beyond uh, beyond the supervisor to hopefully your workplace mm -hmm. has a has a josh committee or a rep um, and then, uh, like I said, they, uh, they're tasked with, with investigating the situation and, and uh, rendering a decision, whether, mm -hmm. that, um, whether there's actually a health and safety risk or, or a significant okay. one enough to stop work. Great. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, I, I think it does. I think that was very helpful. And we've got a comment in chat from Peter, who's, who's clearly given this some thought, and says, acting safely is the same as working safely. Conducting yourself in a safe manner begins early in life. I believe this needs to be part of the education curriculum, beginning early in schools. This should entrench the concept in our youth who become active members of the workforce so they understand what a safe workplace looks like. This includes all aspects of safety, mental and physical. How do we include labor history early in schools so all the gains of unionization become second nature early so all understand that unionization is not a cost to employers, but a benefit? And there's some support for that point, Peter. I'm reminded of a, a colleague and I working with community organizations around the province. Uh, groups often struggle with, uh, you know, reading financial statements and things of that, that nature. And we used to comment that we're not born knowing how to read financial statements. We're also not born knowing what our, our rights to, to safety are in the workplace. And I think sometimes they're assumed. And clearly there is a need for, for greater awareness and education in this regard. A question from Sarah, what is your sense regarding numbers of unreported workplace accidents in the province and how can we address the barriers to reporting? Maybe, so, Nicole, uh, maybe Nicole, do you want to touch on near misses and that kind of stuff? I think because mm -hmm. that's an important aspect, you know, to make sure that stuff gets recorded in the workplace. And I just want to mm -hmm. say to the question around the education component, Mm -hmm. So um, we, we are trying to do that stuff, although it's extremely difficult to get into the mm -hmm. actually into the school system embedded yeah. like 
you know, the individuals uh, suggesting. But uh, on the 25th anniversary of the Westray Mine, we actually did a live stream um, with school kids. We had some at the uh, Museum of Industry in New Glasgow, where we had some miners there, some of the first responders that responded to the Westray Mine, where the kids got to see some of the equipment they used up the day and got to hear from some of those first responders. And that was played out into a number of schools across the province to grades uh, seven, eight, and nine, where the teacher wanted to kind of connect into that where they could and they got to ask some questions and and hear from some panelists like we do there so we're trying to do more of that stuff uh it's it's not easy to do um but it's you know it's something we're continually thinking about and trying to do but i i couldn't agree more i think uh, mm. the federation of labor and many of the unions for as long as i've been around have always been trying to think about ways to get embedded into the school system, create some education, not just about health and safety, but about unionization as well. Mm -hmm. An important point for people to remember that there's lots of documented studies that say uh, uh, unionized workplace are much safer workplaces as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Danny. Nicole, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it's um, sort of, I think we need to normalize the reporting, I guess, is what I would say to that. Um, like Danny said, there's near misses that happen in the workplace and there is process uh, to report those types, of, uh, those types of near misses. So that could be anything. It doesn't have to be a significant issue. So it could be anything from a equipment malfunction um, mm -hmm. to something more severe. Um, and just getting those processes in places in the workplace, because I don't have a sense like Danny said unionized work work environments are generally safer um, and that's because for the most part those processes are in place um, my fear would be um, for non-unionized work environments for the most part where to your other point you know having a sense of what those unreported numbers are I, I would assume they're probably astronomical I, I don't think that um, health and safety training is adequate enough um, with going back to Pauline's point earlier about the about the grocery store clerk or you know somebody leaving high school and going into their first mm -hmm. job it, it's just not yeah. there it does come with uh you know with time but I don't think it's there in the beginning we've all worked first jobs and we can go back in our mind and think about what was I provided with and mm -hmm. and it's not it's nowhere near adequate um so I think really sort of leading by example in your workplace making yourself aware and showing others that you know this is normal to report issues and mm -hmm. and you could save somebody else from from becoming significantly injured yeah yeah excellent points and it strikes me uh, alan before we begin to close off this evening that the work of the westray families group is really going a, a long way in terms of raising awareness and providing the kind of education that's really required out there so thanks so much for the work that you and, and the group do before we begin to wind down this evening's session, Eileen McNeil from Cape Breton Injured Workers Association is offering condolences to the families of those who, whose workers have died on the job. And I think that's a really important point for us to, uh, to perhaps begin to wrap up this evening's webinar series. And um, just as we do that, I would just like to say that this has been an absolutely wonderful launch of the Building Back Better for Nova Scotian Workers web series. I'm pleased to inform you that we will gather again on May 26th for an equally uh, illuminating discussion on childcare as it relates to building back better for workers. So please keep an eye open in mid-May for an invitation to register, which will come to you via your social media feed. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers this evening, Alan, Danny, and Nicole, your insights have been absolutely profound on this International Day of Mourning, and you have given us lots to think about as we consider how to build back better in Nova Scotia from a worker's perspective. Thank you. I would also like to thank all of the people behind the scenes who've made this webinar possible. The Nova Scotia Federation of Labour Committee Chairs, Alan Linkletter, Anne McCullough, Rocky Beals, and Hugh Gillis along with Nicole Kim and Danny Cavanaugh, as well as Joan Wark, who provided fantastic communication support, 
And from Santa Fe's Cody Institute, Brian Lazuri, Manager of Communications, and has been our, our technical wizard this evening. Thank you, Brian. And Anthony Scoggins, Director of Educational Programs, who has been a tremendous supporter of launching this webinar series. And again, I would like to acknowledge the Topshi Memorial Fund's sponsorship of this event. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for this important discussion on this International Day of Mourning. Your interest in building back better for Nova Scotian workers is appreciated and needed to create better workplaces for all. Thank you, and I hope to see you on May 26th for a discussion on childcare. I am Pauline McIntosh from the St. Avex Extension Department, wishing you a good night.